Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I must start by apologizing that I am not speaking to you in Danish. Uh, it would be a very short speech were I to do so. Uh, but I think as a historian of European history, not merely British history, uh, we sometimes take for granted the uh, accommodation that our European partners offer us by uh, conversing in our own language, or my language. So I, first of all, let me make that point. Uh, the second point is that I have to move really quickly. I've been told that all sorts of nasty things will happen to me uh, if I speak for much longer than half an hour. But to begin at the beginning, I thought I'd start with a, an image not from Denmark, but from, uh, from France. This is a classic photograph. It shows Macky uh, in 1944. And I think it's a photograph that, of which the French can be justifiably proud. But there is a particular feature of this that tends to escape the attention of most French historians. Uh, it is not the cigarettes. Uh, it is not uh, the fact that the bar behind them is shut. There is a little point here of these weapons. I think conservatively there's about 12 stent maps there. And the question is, how did they get there? Sometimes a French historian may perhaps wish to think that they sprout out of the fields of Mother France. <laughs> but there is a different story. And that story is one of British cooperation with resistance movements across Europe uh, to achieve uh, a victory like this. I will also draw your attention to the transceiver, the wireless transmitter of British manufacture, that also is part of the vital role that Britain was able to play in linking the resistance with the Allied efforts uh, to defeat the Germans. So in the best way of all those stories to begin at the beginning, SIS, the Secret Intelligence Service, often known as MI6, started looking at the need to develop clandestine warfare as early as 1935, four years before the outbreak of war. This man was the chief of SIS, and he recruited this man, Major Lawrence Grant of the British Army, the Royal Engineers. Uh, he wrote a report, MI6 liked his report so much that he was asked to form uh, a new section, Section 9 or Section D. Part of the time he was based at this building here. This is uh, the headquarters of MI6 during the Second World War. Uh, and what stories that building uh, could tell us. It's still there, but it is, looks a little bit different now. And Grant Section D was to look at the, uh, the techniques, the, uh, the tactics of clandestine warfare, but also uh, to begin to produce equipment. And one of the many, many items was this. This is the famous time pencils. <coughs> this is a means of initiating a, an explosive device over a time delay. This was these were produced in tens of millions in the United Kingdom. The Germans found them and claimed that they invented them. We gave some to the Poles. They said they invented them. Uh, we gave some to the Russians. They said they invented them. And even our American allies, to whom we gave them, said they invented them as well. But you could take it from me, as a government official, it's really British. <laughs> Meanwhile, the British Army was getting involved in looking forward. And in 1938, this uh, relatively junior officer was uh, tasked with looking at clandestine warfare. Uh, rather more from the uh, guerrilla warfare, this sort of tactics uh, and doctrine. Uh, he was very uh, far-thinking, very intelligent, and he managed to bring in a wide group of other young, very bright, uh, many of them had spoke many languages into this new organization called MIR, Military Intelligence Research. 
And amongst those he brought in uh, was this man. Uh, he didn't look like that when he brought him in. This is him later as a, uh, as a major general. Uh, but Colin Gubbins, who we will see in a bit, was really to become the leading figure in SOE. And MIR also produced its own type of weaponry. Uh, this is one of the early types. This is called a limpet mine. It's designed to be stuck to the side of a warship or a merchant ship, uh, and the explosive in it would detonate. Uh, I met the son of the man who invented it, and he said it was great because his father had lots of toy magnets in his workshop, uh, and it was a wonderful place for a young boy to grow up, although he didn't know the rather sinister plans uh, <coughs> that his father was working on. So, Section D and MIR are working concepts together. When war breaks out in 1939, uh, they begin to speak to allies, they continue the development of the equipment, but they too, like the rest of, of Western Europe, if you like, were overwhelmed by the German attacks, uh, first in Poland in September 39, and then of course in the spring and summer of 1940. Little was done during that period by either of the organizations. A sad uh, indictment, if you like, of all those five years of planning. Most of the, the most effective work they did in the, in the uh, summer of 1940 was to prepare a British resistance <coughs> the Germans ever invaded. So meanwhile, MI6 and the War Office were planning uh, how to use uh, irregular warfare. Uh, this man suddenly appeared, deciding that this was an area that he wished to control. He was Hugh Dalton, uh, a British politician, a socialist, who was the Minister for Economic Warfare. And he felt that resistance should best be uh, exploited, not by the military, but by the men and women, the workers. Uh, and he set about gaining, seeking to gain control of this form of clandestine warfare. As has been said, uh, Winston Churchill uh, was keen uh, to do anything uh, to attack uh, the German occupation. And he approved, although he didn't like Dalton, uh, he approved uh, the setting up of a new special organization under the auspices of his ministry. Stuart Mingus, the new chief of MI6, wasn't that interested in special operations. He needed to concentrate on intelligence gathering. And finally, in July 1940, Neville Chamberlain, uh, the former Prime Minister, signed a document establishing a new organization called the Special Operations Executive, SOE. And this, if you like, is the most important single British secret service to work uh, to defeat uh, and overcome uh, the occupation of Western Europe. One of the sensible things that uh, Dalton did was to retain some of the early uh, individuals like Colin Govitz uh, and his organization was robust, was very, very tough, very forward-looking, very unconventional uh, and it has to be said this made it not always very popular with the Foreign Office, with the War Office uh, or even MI6. He appointed this man, Frank Nelson, to be his first uh, head of the organization. And to cast that mind back a little, he sacked Lawrence Grant, the man who had set up Section D uh, two years before. <coughs> it was probably the right decision, but the way in which he sacked this individual was rather uh, unseemly. One of the things that SOE benefited from was it was very stable. In the whole of the Second World War, it only had two chiefs, uh, two ministers. The first being Hugh Dalton, and the second being Lord Selborne. They only had three executive heads. We met Frank Nelson, the second one was Sir Charles Hambro, and finally 
uh, Colin Gubbins actually was able to run the whole organization. SOE divided its organization into separate country sections. Uh, there was one for Norway, uh, one for Belgium, one for Holland, and as you can see, there was one for Denmark. So you can see Ralph Hollingworth uh, was the moving light in the Danish uh, section. It was rather more complicated than that. Uh, there were six separate sections working into France. Uh, so you can see the complexities straight away. Uh, there were great difficulties sometimes because SOE was reliant upon the governments in exile for giving them uh, agent recruits. Uh, there were frequent uh, debates and disputes about the targeting and the tasking. And in this respect actually makes the Danish story um, a rather good one for Britain. In as much as it could control in large part uh, SOE's activities and it could control uh, a large part uh, of the beginnings of Danish resistance. SOE was very, very effective about training its, its agents. Uh, this is one of the uh, training establishments given over to the Danish section. But there were well over a hundred separate training establishments in the United Kingdom. We've looked a little bit at some of the uh, equipment that uh, SOE or its, SOE's predecessors it also produced a huge amount uh, of weapons uh, and special devices. So much so that they produced these. They're like an IKEA catalog. Uh, you could actually uh, pick what you want, and I could talk for another four days about this, but I'll just quickly run through it. A rather humorous and odd looking uh, uh, piece of equipment. This is probably the, uh, uh, the type of jumpsuit uh, that Fleming Moose describes in his book. Uh, it was for being uh, parachuted into water. Here we have the means of uh, disguising explosive devices and the very famous exploding rat. Uh, that actually was uh, manufactured and examples were dropped into France. Exploding coal. Uh, you, ex you excavate uh, a, a block of coal, you put plastic explosive in it, uh, and you put one of those time uh, devices in. A rather odd looking uh, <laughs> item. Um, uh, one of the things inside that, uh, I think we all can probably guess what it is, uh, is something called a tire burster, which is a mini mine. It's, it's a, like a pressure mine. And they were able to, to camouflage it to look like stones or in this particular example, uh, animal manure. Wireless sets. Uh, the whole point about SOE needed to communicate. Here we have one of the later, smaller trans transceivers. This is an example of the, uh, the factory that built some of them. Uh, this is uh, a receiver, not a transceiver, i.e. could only receive messages from the UK. Camouflaging of wireless sets. The limpet mine, if you cast your mind back to the other sketch, you can see things have moved on a bit. And then also there was a lethal element to it as well. Uh, this is the 9mm well rod, a silenced pistol uh, that uh, carried the ammunition actually uh, in the handle there. And this is the sort of equipment that SOE was producing for the use of resistance movements uh, all over Europe, but as we're focusing on Denmark, substantially to Denmark. But how do you get them there? There's no point recruiting agents. There's no point manufacturing material if they just stay in the United Kingdom. The best way, and in many respects the only way, to deliver that material was by air. This is a good concept, but do you have the aircraft? <coughs> well, at first, no, they didn't. It wasn't until August 1940 that the Royal Air Force made its first flight to land a secret agent in occupied Europe. Uh, it used a Lysander aircraft, this rather small, short takeoff and landing aircraft, uh, and tragically uh, the aircraft appears to have been shot down on the way back from its operation to northern France. 
It was the first flight of a new uh, unit called 419 Flight uh, that later on was transformed into the special duty squadrons that Brian will tell you, uh, Nigel will tell you about later. It wasn't just landing, it was also delivering agents by parachute. Here we have uh, the Whitley, a fairly obsolete aircraft even in 1940. Uh, but the flight was equipped with Lysanders for the landings and Whitleys for dropping agents and supplies. Well, the really challenging thing is that Although this seemed eminently sensible to SOE uh, and to the Ministry of Economic Warfare, there was really serious opposition from senior elements within the Royal Air Force. Notably, Sir Charles Portal, the Chief of the Air Staff, and this gentleman, Arthur Harris, known as Bomber Harris, the head of Bomber Command. And both of these gentlemen believe that any diversion of one single, even one aircraft, from dropping bombs on Germany was a waste of time. Uh, Portal uh, complained to SOE saying that your activities are a gamble, uh, mine is a surefire certainty. So how is it that the RAF managed to carry on? Basically because of this gentleman here, he tended to get what he wanted in the Second World War, but also the gentleman around him and I'm not talking so much about Portal. Because SOE got its tasking from the Chiefs of Staff. SOE and European resistance was seen as being an important part of the British and Allied grand strategy. And so the Chiefs of Staff were able to overrule uh, Portal and Harris when they sought to oppose um, SOE's uh, demands for it. Now we're focusing on Denmark, and quite rightly, uh, that's where we are and that's the intention. But let's not forget that the Royal Air Force was obliged to service other resistance movements. And here we have Belgium, France, Holland, Denmark, Norway, Germany, Austria, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Italy, Estonia. I bet you didn't think there was, they were flying to Estonia. Uh, they did, not frequently, but this shows you the amount of pressure, the amount of wear and tear, uh, and the challenges of meeting the needs of uh, a truly European resistance movement. The other point to remember is that the priorities <coughs> kept on changing. It has to be said that France was pretty well always a big priority, because it was the place where the Second Front would begin. Czechoslovakia started as a priority and then started to diminish. Austria and Germany, the operations there were really rather limited, um, but certainly uh, Norway, uh, Belgium, and increasingly Denmark, as the war went on, was of vital importance. I mentioned the, the fact that the, the uh, operations were maintained and sustained by the fact that Churchill and the Chiefs of Staff wanted it to happen. But arguably, just as important was the fact that these men and women wanted it to happen. Uh, the commitment of the special duty squadrons, of which there was two, 138 and 161, two in the UK. These men and women worked with the men and women of SOE and MI6 throughout the war. Uh, and in spite of the top level opposition, uh, the squadrons were absolutely intent on making sure that the job was done uh, and done well. Uh, here we have uh, one of the rather more famous photographs of the RAF pilots who landed the Lysanders in occupied France. Now this is the, where it all happened, RAF Tempsford. Uh, in Bedfordshire, uh, it only uh, really was uh, created as an airfield uh, in 1942. Um, uh, but it was the centre for all the clandestine flights uh, from the UK, apart from a little one down in the south. Um, and it is still there today. Uh, if, you, if you're very lucky, you can actually get onto it. Many of the buildings have been destroyed. But it is a really atmospheric place, certainly for those of us who, who have studied it, that, that you can really have a sense of place, of history, uh, and of purpose. Uh, 
uh, another photograph of it there. Now this is a slight indulgence of mine. We will hear about one particular crash earlier on, but this is an, an aircraft of great importance personally for me. It was the aircraft flown by uh, Group Captain uh, Ron Hockey, who was the commanding officer of 138 Squadron, uh, uh, the boss of, of the squadron, perhaps maybe when Nigel's father was flying with it. This is a photograph taken in Egypt, so they sometimes went even that far. Uh, but it was also the aircraft that Ron Hockey flew when he dropped the agents that assassinated SSO Wilgroff and Führer Reinhardt Heydrich in Prague in 1942. And when I was doing some research about my latest book about an SOE agent in France, and I went through the records to try and find what the aircraft was, lo and behold, it was this aircraft. Uh, by total serendipity that the aircraft that dropped uh, the agent that I'm writing about, a guy called Tony Brooks, uh, it actually was the same aircraft that Ron had flown uh, to drop the agents in uh, in, in Czechoslovakia. So that's a quick whistle stop tour through the evolution of uh, SOE and its commitment. I sometimes uh, reflect on what would European resistance have looked like without SOE uh, and the Royal Air Force. Uh, it may seem a rather stupid question because the answer is, of course, it would not have looked the same. But I think you could go a little bit further, and it may be even more fundamental. Say, so would there really have been a resistance, uh, an armed resistance, a resistance that could actually have taken part in the liberation of Europe without these two organizations that even in the United Kingdom are, are still rather unsung. SOE tends to be thought of mainly operating in France, uh, and sadly the special duty squadrons of the Royal Air Force tend to rather get lost in this great uh, national focus upon uh, the bombing offensive against uh, Nazi Germany. So interestingly enough, um, uh, the people who opposed the RAF's uh, involvement, um, maybe they've still got their way, maybe they, uh, the focus is still theirs. But it's important, uh, I think, for events such as this, uh, and I don't mean to do them in Denmark, I have the chance to do them elsewhere, that we can articulate and we can really uh, seek to identify uh, a truth, a truth of sacrifice, uh, and the truth of courage uh, that should not be forgotten. And when we talk about sacrifice, um, I was doing some research about the casualties of these two squadrons, uh, 138 and 161. Uh, during the course of the war, 75 aircraft were shot down just going to France. I was very surprised to find that 17 aircraft were shot down in operations to Denmark. Uh, quite uh, salutary, quite uh, disturbing almost, was the fact that somewhere in the region of 600 air crew, just from these two squadrons, uh, lost their lives uh, in their work to support the resistance. And that is particularly interesting because many years ago, uh, a rule of honor was compiled about SOE. A rule of honor of all those who had lost their lives in SOE, both in Europe, but also all around the world. Uh, and that role of honor amounted to round about 650 names. So when you think of the balance, uh, these two squadrons lost as many uh, men as the whole of an organiza a global organization uh, that numbered well in excess of 13,000 people. The cold courage of night after night after night of undertaking these operations. The cold courage of going to a dropping zone and finding there is no recognition signal, so you have to bring your passenger and the containers back and maybe do it again the next night. It leaves somebody such as myself, whose parents were in the Royal Air Force, just amazed and very humbled 
uh, by the bravery uh, of my forebears. I think I have reached my limit. I will stop now. And thank you very much for your patience.